Let's talk Tommy John surgery. So a lot of questions I get are about some pearls of the rehab process and what I do and, or what recommendations I might have. So a uh, number one pearl after UCL reconstruction um, is, and this is universal, it doesn't matter if you see patients in New York or if you see someone from California, but do not force their emotion early on. Uh, you will get yourself in a lot of trouble with the patient, with the physician. So that's number one. We got two more coming up, but let's dive a little deeper into this. So UCL reconstruction, uh, you might not have a lot of experience seeing these because they are not done at a tremendously high volume, at least not yet. I mean, only time will tell if people start blowing these things out quicker and quicker, which seems to be the trend. But um, you might see one of these patients in your clinic as a one-off and you might not have experience with a lot of them. So hopefully this helps a little bit and we'll have a lot more uh, YouTube videos coming out on UCL reconstruction, all phases of uh, rehab, as well as uh, some patient information. So stay tuned with those or for those. So if you do see someone in your clinic after UCL reconstruction, um, it probably will be anywhere from one to four or one to six weeks after surgery. So typically they're in a splint for the first week. They're not moving much. Stitches are in. Stitches come out after seven days. They're put in a uh, hinge brace. And depending on the physician or the surgeon that uh, operated on the athlete, they have different range of motion restrictions for the brace. Some let early motion, some wait for and have delayed motion. Um, typically what I've seen after seeing over 150, 200 of these is there's a gradual progression of flexion in the brace, All right? So for us, it's, um, you know, gradually progressing over a five week period up to 90 degrees and we're slower to um, increase flexion just due to the strain on the graft. So early on, when they come out of that brace around the five to six week mark, and you might start seeing them in the clinic for formal therapy, they're probably only gonna have between 90 and 100, 115 degrees of motion, which is completely normal. So again, that first pearl is don't think you need to go and crank on this elbow because they don't have full elbow flexion at five weeks. They're not supposed to. And guess what? If you start cranking on that elbow at five, six weeks, you're gonna have one, probably strain the graft, two, irritate the heck out of that elbow. Three, I'm pretty sure you're gonna get a quick call from the surgeon um, saying, what the heck are you doing with my patient? And then they'll send them elsewhere. So keep in mind that after the surgery, there's gonna be swelling in the joint, right? There's gonna be inflammation that's gotta settle down, irritation of soft tissue, it's a very big incision. Um, and a lot of trauma to the soft tissue. So as the inflammation comes down, motion comes back. So pearl number one is always, always, always do not force motion. You wanna guide them back. If there are concerns, you could talk to the surgical team. You grant, obviously you do want to move the elbow, but you don't wanna force the motion. Um, number two, I'd say is probably gradual strength progression for these patients and making sure that we strengthen the forearm muscles. I think a lot of people are afraid to do uh, strengthening for the elbow flexors or wrist flexors and pronators because they don't want to irritate uh, the medial elbow, which is completely understandable. And I don't advise aggressive strengthening. So there are ways around that, whether it's use of BFR or low resistance. But we know that those dynamic stabilizers, medial elbow muscles are very, very important in protecting the inside of the elbow. And some of those muscles actually come in and they lay right on top of that graph, right on top of the anterior bundle of the UCL. So we want to work our flexor pronators. We want to work our um, FCU. Um, we want to make sure that we target those medial elbow stabilizers because they will absolutely offload the elbow as your patient is progressing and offload that ligament. And I'd say my next pearl, and this is probably one of the more important ones, I guess they're all really important, so, um, is to follow a criteria-based progression when you're rehabbing your elbows. So you wanna make sure that they're going through a gradual progression of range of motion, they're decrease, or decreasing pain while you're getting back your motion, then we're gonna progress strength. So strength below shoulder height, strength above shoulder height, and please, please, please do not forget to put them through some rehab plyometrics. And by rehab plyos, I do not mean weighted ball programs where they're going running guns and rocker throws. But what I mean is that they are doing a progressive uh, progression, essentially, of double arm throws into a plyo back or trampoline at your chest, overhead, and then chops to make sure we're getting some elbow extension and the elbows tolerating it well and they're recovering well. And then we progress to single arm plyometrics at the side and then up at 90-90. And then they're throwing the ball into the trampoline 
um, at a light, at a short distance. And really the goal of this is to make sure they're prepared for the next phase of the program, which is going to be throwing. So for me in the clinic, you've got to prove that you can progress to the next level, whether it's pain-free strengthening below shoulder height to get to over shoulder height or pain-free 90-90 strengthening to get to plyometrics. And of course, it's good response to your plyometrics before we even think about letting you move on to a interval throwing program. And of course, there's all sorts of criteria that you're going to have to meet in order to start throwing as well. It's very objective testing we do these days, but and we'll do another um, YouTube video on that. But that's my next pearl, right? So first we have do not force motion, number one. Number two, gradual progression of strength, especially the elbow and the wrist flexor pronator group that sits on top of that ligament. Three, you want to make sure you go through a pretty um, objective, criteria-based progression for these patients. And you gradually, you know, work them you know along the way and you're gradually increasing stress on the ligament or of course building posterior shoulder strength we know that the shoulder um, is going to absorb some of that force as well and really you've got to work down the chain so you've got to outside of the shoulder you've got to work down from the scap to the t-spine the hips balance foot and ankle work so that all should be addressed early on in rehab you have plenty of time in the early stages of this rehab process to work the entire kinetic chain and find really deficiencies in their kinetic chain. And in all honesty, these patients um, really have never had more time in their throwing careers from the age of five. I mean, this is the longest that they're probably gonna be shut down their entire life. So taking your time to identify the impairments down the chain and then to have a corrective program set in place to help keep them busy and keep them occupied. So. I hope this helps. Uh, leave comments. Please like, subscribe, and share this video. We're going to have plenty more of these coming up on all sorts of phases of the UCL progression, uh, as well as patient information as they're going through rehab after UCL reconstruction. Uh, keep in mind, there are a lot of variations of this surgery happening now, so we, I think we've got to address all of those, whether it's internal braces, uh, UCL reconstruction with ulnar nerve transpositions, we have UCL repairs, we have UCL revisions, so there's a lot of topics that we can cover. Uh, but again, like, subscribe, leave comments and any other topics you want covered, and we will uh, hopefully get to them. Thank you.